we're here. We say good evening to you wherever you are in Dominica, the Caribbean, and the world. This is the radio program of the Dominica Freedom Party, Freedom and You. We have a very packed program for you here this evening. We have online Jeff Phillips. Well, I'm, I'm here, but Anita is here. Uh, Bernard Pito, and we are out to have a very good program with you this evening. Many of you have said you've not been hearing. We have already explained it is the first Wednesday of every month. Some people say the first Wednesday of every month sound to them like a very long time. I know that. And of course, we told you why we can only do the first Wednesday of every month. But we're here and we thank you for, of course, looking forward to us being here on the program as we share with you this evening. Well, we bit late, so we were trying to get a few things wrapped up. Let's see. Good evening to party leader. Good evening, good evening, Bosso, and good evening to uh, our guests online and, and members online and uh, panelists, as well as, as uh, of course, as uh, the general public. So, as you said, uh, first Wednesday is something we look forward eagerly to. We uh, we hope, we plan, we expect to be, you know, uh, back to doing this more regularly, but um, we are very, very happy in the first of the month to share the thoughts and ideas with um, our fellow, fellow citizens. And let's say good evening to Jeff. Bell out online. Jeff, good evening. Good evening to you, boss. Good evening to you, party leader. Good evening to all the all panelists, Alvin and Michael, and to all the listeners to this great Freedom on You program tonight. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Well, we were expecting Michael and Alvin Thomas. I'm not seeing if they're here as yet, but as soon as they join us, we will. I'm here, Boston. Johnson, oh, I'm here. Yes, I'm going to see. Go, well, go let, ahead, me say, go, let me say good evening to our listeners, to fellow Freedomites, and to Dominicans, no matter where they are, and other listeners. Yes, thank you. Um, well, Alvin, Thomas. Okay, um, so Michael, thanks a lot. We expect Alvin to join us anytime. So as soon as you join, we'll have him um, with you up there. Our numbers are 449 449-3096, 449-3097. That's the numbers here. And the overseas line, 305-432-9624. So a little later, we'll take your calls. But we always advise when you call, please be brief. And let's do it in good taste. We want to extend our sympathy to the family, relatives, and friends of the late Mr. Lawrence Augustine Peters, of well, originally from Grand Bay, but resided obviously in Goodwill. Um, his son, who is you know one of the Bouillon leaders on the island, we say to Ra and of course to Glenn Peters in Kenfield and the rest of his children, his wife, and of course, relatives and friends, we extend our heartfelt sympathy. And of course, to Gustav Williams, on the past of his brother, Gust Gustus, Augustus Williams, aka S of Point Michelle, he buried last week, Tuesday, he had a very good send off. A number of persons from far and near came out in support with the family, and it was a very good send off that he received. And to all those who lost loved ones in the past month, we want to extend our heartfelt sympathy to all of you. Now, um, when we were here last Wednesday, the last Wednesday we were here, that is the first Wednesday of July, we had said to you that Pilis Augustus was at the hospital. He had suffered a, a stroke, and we asked that you pray for him. The following Friday, he passed. And that's our first time since his passing. So again, we want to extend our sympathy and to spend some time on him, Prince Augustus, and we extend our sympathy to his family, his wife, Louise, his son, daughters, and adopted daughter, siblings, nieces, nephews, you know, got children, friends. And we'll do a, a, spend a few hour, a few minutes. Um, time is not permitting, but we'll spend a few minutes on Kiddis. As you know, Kiddis was a solid individual. Um, 
in the trade union movement of Dominica and the Caribbean, but he served at the level of the Caribbean Congress of Labor. He served as education officer there, and later he became the Secretary General of the CC Caribbean Congress of Labor. On his return to Dominica, he continued with the Waterfront and Arab Workers Union, and upon his passing, he was the Secretary Treasurer of the Waterfront and Arab Workers Union. And he also served as the Assistant Treasurer of the Dominican Freedom Party, very loyal, loyal and patriotic, dependable individual, one that, you know, provided good guidance to, to, to all. In fact, we had a, a statement we sent out to the media on his passing. I will see if I can get it and talk a little of it. And then from there, um, we'll read a letter that was sent to the, to the wife on his passing. So let me see if I can get this letter and I can come back. The, not this letter, the um, statement we made. And I could come back because it's all on the same, same area here of what we're doing here. So let me see if I can do that. I think what we can do though is to probably read the letter, party leader, while we get the statement. Certainly, certainly. Uh, we felt it important not only, of course, we were personally there and uh, at, at the family home, Curtis, of course, was a, a valued uh, member of, of the Freedom Party for, for many, many years. And, um, you know, it, it, it was very important for us to show solidarity with us and to beyond simply being part of the party, but as a friend, as a colleague and someone we, we've spent a lot of time with and as friends, of course, we had to be um, very involved his final send off and, and spend time with the family um, as friends and colleagues. But we also thought it was important that we put something formal together as uh, you know a recognition, a formal recognition of the party to, to his family. And so we were um, we, we presented this letter in a more formal ma manner to his wife. So um, and, and what we, we, we wrote to her is we you know we said dear Mrs. Augustus, the Dominic Freedom Party wishes wishes through this letter to officially express our heartfelt sympathy to you and your family on the passing of your husband and our dear brother, Mr. Curtis Augustus, who departed this life on Friday, July 9, 2021. His death came as a shock to many at home and abroad, knowing that he had been seen and heard a few days before what is considered a quick departure of your brother from this life. However, as Christians, we believe that God knows best and took him to a better place. Curtis has a long, left a long and lasting legacy of service to humanity as you are known. At the local, regional, and international level, he was a true citizen in every respect. He will surely be missed by us as a long standing member of the DFP, having served on the executive committee in the position of assistant treasurer until his passing. During his time in the party, we valued immensely his good advice, counseling, and appreciated his, his level of commitment that he displayed as well as the stable hand approach that he brought to, to our discussions and decision making. His fight to uphold democracy, responsible governance, and his ability to mediate and help settle disputes will not go unnoticed. It is well known that Curtis was a devoted family man and someone who lived with a strong faith in God. He gave a lot of himself to others, particularly the working people and the trade union movement in Dominica, the Caribbean region, internationally. He epitomized what can be best be described as a covenant of human solidarity. His passing is a big loss for Dominic and the trade union movement regionally and internationally, as well as the Dominic Freedom Party. We continue to mourn his passing and pray that God Almighty will strengthen you and comfort you and your family as you prepare to lay your husband and our dear brother to his resting place. We will continue to be there with you and for you and your family. In closing, we would also like to thank you and your family for sharing the life of Curtis Peters. Again, our heartfelt sympathy to you and your family. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Yes, yeah, so that was God, a no, no. God bless you and your family. Yes. So that was a letter we sent to the wife on behalf of the Freedom Party. Now the statement we issue is passing in the Need for you at this time. It is your sadness that we hold in the hands of today's pastors, a stubborn member of the trade union movement. In Dominica, Curtis has made his contribution to the government of 
Yes, so that's what we issued upon this passing. Uh, we passed on the Friday, the 9th of July, and a memorial tribute was held in his honor on last week, Wednesday, that was last Wednesday, and very, very well put together by the executive and members of the union, a number of persons spoke there, um, including the president of the Waterfront Workers Union, Brother Donald Rule, and a number of other persons who spoke. I spoke on behalf of the Freedom Party. We had Mr. Amo Thomas spoke as field officer spoke there. We had Christine Kelshell. Executive members spoke, the port section spoke, Mr. Binwa Badwell spoke, Mr. Nigel Lawrence, number of persons, Mr. Alvin Thomas, not Alvin Thomas, Mr. Thomas Later, that is from the DPSU, we had Mr. Celia Nicholas, former General Secretary of the Teachers Union, we had Ms. Vanya Martin spoke. So a number of persons spoke there, and we cannot hear everybody. He had a very good send-off. Very good. Very good send-off. I think the, the, the homily was quite good. Very good. Well, very well attended, and I think the number of persons who showed up and uh, the crowd and the appreciation that was shown to him spoke very well. Who he was as a man, and as a, as a citizen, and I think he made his family very proud uh, to, to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, well, you know that, um, as we said, it's a big blow for the trade union movement. But in the interest of time, though, all those persons who spoke at the memorial tribute will just play um, his son, who his son is. Yes. So we're going to play um, his son, Chris Augustus Jr., give, I think, a very well deserving, you know. Um, presentation there on the of his father and the crowd is very much appreciative of it. So we'll for in the interest of time we'll just play it because all the other speeches will be very long. Sure, sure. So we will just we we'll just play Curtis. That's the son of Curtis Augustus. His name is Curtis Augustus Junior. <laughs> I 
Why not be active? Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's protecting and whether to pursue the interests of programs and to promote the great elected goals. Above all, we must be reasonable. And the one children under the belief that we are our own brothers here. In surgery, we fought for, we defended, and became a voice of the worker. Specifically, the most vulnerable groups, such as the organized, understood, and unmarketed. We demand that laws, policies, and procedures protect workers in such a way that they cannot be easily invaded. Protecting workers' rights to human rights shows that workers' rights are vital, and in most cases, workers shall have arguments of profit and efficiency. Human rights are above all moral claims about the normative standards to which we all these societies should strive. On the workers' level, we must put on the land. Husband, brother, uncle, family man, leader, manager, but most of all, he was a die hard captain. He worked hard, sometimes and knowingly so, but also knew how to have fun. He was always attentive and present, patient and kind, full of wisdom. He thrived on the idea of service to others and encouraged others to do the same. He loved my mother and all his kids, unconditionally, and above all, he loved God. So, this is a man whose contributions to my childhood and life have been much more than just being a driver, but also being a president. A man who has influenced who I am at the very core of my being, serving not only as a living picture of godliness, honesty, integrity and responsibility, but routinely models the qualities that I want to exhibit. The model taught me the importance of being honest and reliable, the value of hard work, the significance of truth, and the honor of duty. By the way, I always liked my choices or being in agreement with everything that I did. You always gave me the room to make mistakes, the freedom to make mistakes, and yet constantly supporting me. That I did. I feel blessed to have such a place where I can that. Okay. God would wish this gathering with many people different circumstances to include the fun of the 74th birthday, just a few weeks away from the Santa Claus, on his wedding anniversary on the 12th of August. We would not want this to be a sad day in our lives. Instead, let's take this moment to shift our thoughts. From how much we will be missed, to really find it on, on your own funny, laughable, joyful, and proof of science that you shared with them. I know they exist because we have been inundated with and sustained by the stories we so many of you over the last few since this passing. So, in conclusion, let us remember him. We leave those interactions, enjoy them, smile at them, and commit to continuing the event. If I work here, do so tirelessly. Let us all pass in our own special way. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
But of course, party leader Curtis, uh, we heard quite a lot about Curtis, and all what we heard was true. The BS had program, you know, on in his life, and mm -hmm. a number of persons spoke, and they represented quite well the person that Mr. Augustus was. And as we said, there is a big blow for the Tribune movement in Dominica and the Caribbean extension. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. And we, we're just spending a little time here to discuss how we should just recognize Curtis and uh, you know, sh show, show the respect and show, show, show the appreciation that we had for him. Certainly uh, a man who has spent so much time giving so much of his life to Dominica and to the Freedom Party and to the society as a whole. We just thought we should take take a few moments, a few minutes of the program to, to focus on him and to give him the recognition that we think he deserves. And, and I think when we lose people like Curtis, it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a blow because such such leaders uh, are becoming increasingly very young people who will stand up for the right thing, people who are willing to express the right thing, people who are willing to take a stance based on principle and what they believe. And so. Um, losing someone like Curtis who brought that uh, set of values and that approach to life and was able to lead society and, and, and to have conversations that were that necessary when they needed to be had um, is a very important thing. And so what's going on now with all the issues that are going on now, I know Curtis would have been deeply involved. Curtis would have been, uh, uh, you know, um, advocated for the right thing and uh, advocating for the rules, because as we know, he was a guy who was a stickler for the rules, who followed the rules, who would be able to put the rules to you. And so the, the sort of breakdown that we see in law and order and the sort of breakdown that we see in institutional control is something that greatly bothered him. And, and I know it's something that we, um, as a party, uh, we will keep fighting for on behalf of Curtis to maintain that vigilance um, to the rules, to, to, to ask him for the right things to be done. And so um, we recognize him, we, we celebrate him with, with his family, but I think the most important thing we can do for Curtis, and we will do for Curtis, and for all of our fellow Dominicans, is to keep as a party fighting uh, for the principle that um, the rules matter. That's how a society functions and becomes a mature, serious society. We decide on good rules and then we adhere to them. We apply the rules. And so we see many, many um, situations now where um, that, that's not the case. Um, certainly, we believe that many of the issues uh, 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 in, in the current um, COVID situation were caused by people flaunting the rules. Uh, 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 many, in many ways, um, we know that the uh, you know, you know, leadership and various leaders have not been very um, consistent in following the rules themselves. Uh, putting themselves through to, to the same procedures and for the same sort of uh, restrictions and, 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 and uh, you know, quarantine protocols. Um, this is in place for everyone, for everyone, including the leadership, and most importantly for the, for the leadership of the country, because they set the tone, they set the example for the, for the society. And so um, making sure that um, the rules are followed, that we select good rules as a community and then we adhere to them and we apply them is a very critical point of a well-functioning society. And that's the kind of thing that uh, so, uh, you know, Curtis fought for, 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 the, for, for, for workers' rights, for, for, for employers to respect the rules and the procedures that apply to, to workers so that they got a fair deal and a good deal. And in the same way, you know, that applies in a broadly society, we need good rules and we need them for. We need to uh, uh, apply them fairly um, for good things, good outcomes for everyone. So fighting for those principles is something that we will do, continue to do, uh, in honor of Curtis, and really as the right thing, as the value set that we believe as a body, and which Curtis most certainly subscribe to. Yes. I don't know if um, Michael or Jeff want briefly to add anything to what has been said as well. Well, I just want to say that uh, the contribution that uh, Curtis Augustus, um, deceased, may so rest in peace, made to the Commonwealth of Dominica um, is significant. And it's rather unfortunate 
with all the hard work that Mr. Augustus has done, um, he has not, he never received a national award, um, despite all his hard work. And a lot of time when people die, we saw this good thing about them. Just um, so they had a conversation with someone, they asked me the same question with the work of the new division. And I said, well, who's me? I mean, if a guy of Curtis who have made such contribution to the Commonwealth of Dominica uh, has not even received a national award. And the person was very surprised to hear that. And also, I'm subject to correction to hear. But as far as I know, the, the work the man has done, not just in Dominica, the region internationally, this guy um, should have been recognized um, on a national level um, mm -hmm. for the work he's done. And too bad he's gone to school. And, um, you know, he's going to be a big force in the trade union, um, not just in Dominica, but globally. And I think um, his dedication, hard work, um, not just um, into um, Dominica only, but globally, and what he has accomplished and was very part of the Dominican Freedom Party, um, young man get to know him, and the work he has done. And um, even myself, I when I have questions about certain things in Dominica, I would go to him about certain laws and unions, um, I would um, go to him. In fact, I remember working at um, a, a company in King Phil, Sylvester Textile, and there was a huge strike one time. I imagine people didn't strike anymore. There was a strike there, and the unions came together and worked together with that company. It was actually a company there um, that was actually in Dominica by its through the CBI program. Um, it was a group of Koreans came in, they had um, um, passports, and you know, the thing was to start a business in Dominica. And they started Silverstar Textile Factory. Actually, guys like Bolo, who sell Buja, can tell about that company, it was great. And the unions came together and make sure that, you know, like the employees are more cheated fairly and so on. And uh, uh, Mr. Gossoff, so, so, mm -hmm. so he has contributed significantly. And, and um, I hope that um, he'll be remembered. And I hope that something be done in the trade union, um, some monument or something um, to honor the great um, Felix Augustus. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, is Michael saying anything or? Okay, well, we'll have to move on. Well, you know, last Sunday. Um, yes, Michael. Yes. yes um, Go ahead, Michael. Yes, I said that. I, I want to echo the sentiments that Jeff just raised about Curtis. He's caring for, um, the way he cared a lot about um, workers. I remember in the 2000, 2001 era, there was, uh, Dominica was facing the IMF and had to, the debt was too high and they wanted the civil servants a levy on the civil servant salary to pay for the debt. And this was something I was concerned about, and I tried to get people involved. And w once I met Curtis, he shared the sentiments that I had, that our national debt was created not by the civil servants, but by all of us, because we sit down and allow politicians to take debt without knowing how to service it. And Curtis got the unions to agree that we all should pay for the debt, all employees, not just the civil servants. But we were having difficulties. And Curtis, myself, I was president of the Chamber of Commerce. We went to the length and breadth of Dominica to meet every registered organization that had a membership. And we had a meeting in with the bishop's um, palace in his office, conference room. And there were 96 organizations that we met. And when they all signed that a levy for all of us to pay, and not just the civil servants, two didn't sign on was the civil service, who were the ones that were, who were asked to pay, and the teachers' association, the teachers' union. And um, Curtis was so um, satisfied with that, that, you know, he was, he, I mean, he was, his voice was crackling and like he, he was very pleased. And, and, and that is the nature of the guy, committed. And I, I, that's what I remember of him, very committed. 
very caring and uh, and a very respectful person. I admired Curtis for his um, soberness whenever there were meetings that um, I attended with him both regionally and nationally. Um, he, we, we were in trade negotiations. He was on labor, I was on private sector. And, and, and he had a marked impact, not only on Dominica, but on the regional um, labor um, fraternity where he, he, he partnered with all the labor unions. And um, the tripartite agreement with government, uh, private sector, and labor, he was, one, he was instrumental in that when he was at the ILO in Barbados. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. what, I, what I remember most of is all the satisfaction he got that one set of workers were not going to be burdened with that debt. Yes. Okay, and okay. that's the nature of the, the demand, I remember. Thanks, well, thank you very much for that, and I'm sure um, the listeners out there, particularly those who are familiar with Curtis, um, appreciate very much that Curtis is the type of person that we have just mentioned and would have been said about him here tonight and even before tonight, our true reflection of the individual. May his soul rest in peace, and again, we extend our heartfelt sympathy to his wife, son, daughters, adopted daughter, siblings, nieces, nephews, or children, friends, and the members of the Waterfront and Other Workers Union. Now, time is against us, so we have to be moving quickly, and I just want to um, read, you know, um, on 26th of July, we just gone, Monday gone, um, but this one, the one before. There was an election in, um, in St. Lucia, and um, we just we prepared a release on the outcome of the election. I just want to quickly read it, it's not long. The Dominica Freedom Party congratulates newly elected Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Philip J. Pierre, and the St. Lucia Labour Party on their overwhelming victory, electoral victory at the polls in the general elections held on Monday, July 26, 2021. The DFP described the election's results as the people of St. Lucia exercising their franchise in a big way to choose and bring about changes in the governance of the beloved country. We commend the former Prime Minister, Honorable Arnold Chastney, and his team, the St. Lucia United Workers Party, for their service to the people of St. Lucia for the last five years, as well as preserving and respecting the democratic tradition of their country, which was demonstrated in free and fair general elections held on Monday, July 26, 2021. The St. Lucia Electoral Commission and the Electoral Office must be commended for a great job in maintaining the integrity of the electoral process and remaining true to, the mandate, to their mandate of not being influenced by any other person or authority. Dominica Freedom Party wishes Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre and his team well as they take up the reign of government in their country for the next five years and appeal to the people of St. Lucia to be united as they remain true to working together for the further development of the beloved country. And that was what we prepared on the electoral victory of the Labour Party in St. Lucia. Yeah, I think I think I think I will be learning that we sent out and, and expresses it well. Um, we wish St. Lucia well. Um, one thing, regardless of the political strike that one may be at or political persuasion, it's clear that St. Lucians keep the governments accountable. And that's the sort of thing that um, keeps the democracy healthy, that keeps the society progressive, that gets the government to work in your best interest. When you replace governments regularly, that's a sign of a healthy society. Uh, governments should not establish empires and, and, and uh, you know dynasties um, over many generations. I mean, a generational a generation should not pass by only one government. This this is a sign of an unhealthy government and a healthy society, and a healthy societal process of, of holding governments accountable. And um, the fact that St. Lucia, 
ask the government to work or be replaced is a, is a healthy thing. And um, regardless of um, one's political persuasions or beliefs about the, the government institution, past government, current government, and, and who is better and what who is better serves the interests of the country, the fact of the matter is all governments in St. Lucia are held to work hard, and they do work hard for the people because the people show a certain level of political maturity that, uh, that, that gets the government to work, and that's necessary. Without, without the accountability uh, aspects, we put the government in place to be our, to work for us, our employees. And if we, as the employers, do not keep the employees accountable, then there will be mayhem in, 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 uh, in outcomes. And so uh, that, that is, um, we, again, regardless of political dialogue or conception or, or how we want to think about um, what parties are uh, most effective for the island, the, the, this is an admirable thing that St. Lucian's keep the governments are confident. And so we wish everyone well over there. And um, uh, again, the current government has to perform and to be held accountable. And, uh, and if they do not, it's, it, it, you know, St. Lucian's have shown that they are not that they're willing to, um, to quickly replace them as well. So we shall see. Yes. Um, what we'll do, we'll take the spike in the COVID. So we issued a statement earlier, I think from yesterday, um, but heard it on the news today. And we just want to um, just reinforce it here tonight. Certainly, I mean, I think we, we, we've seen that the, um, you know, uh, the COVID situation, which looked well under control and looked uh, to be going well, in fact, simply going so well that I think there was a certain lack, 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 lack of physical approach to it. Uh, guards were let down. Um, some people were irresponsible. And um, in those situations, um, bad outcomes occur. And um, I, think, I think we are very concerned as a party, as citizens of the country, that um, we seem to be um, slipping down the slope. And so it's very necessary to prevent that because <laughs> once you start slipping down that slope, you're going to gain momentum. So we issued a statement, and I'll just read it to express, you know, to give an understanding of, of, of where we stand as a party on, on the issue and, and what's going on, and uh, you know, what, what, how we, we can we can contribute. Uh, the Dominica Freedom Party is very concerned about the recent spike in COVID-19 infections and apparent incidents of community transmission. We offer our prayers and best wishes to the individuals and communities affected and hope for this speedy recovery. Infectious diseases such as the coronavirus are tipping point phenomena, where things deteriorate rapidly once a critical threshold is hit. We should not allow that to happen. We encourage everyone to cooperate fully with the authorities to protect lives. Political or ideological wrangling should have no place in this matter. Those contacted by a tracing should be cooperative, not confrontational. This is not a fight we have with each other. The fight is out there against this deadly disease. We must not stand opposite to each other arguing about vaccinations or trying to score political points of this pandemic. We should instead be standing shoulder to shoulder, figuring out joint solutions to defeat this deadly enemy. One of the, the chief weapons against this deadly virus is vaccination. During this pandemic, countless people worked tirelessly to find an effective weapon against this disease and they triumphed. Decades of use have shown practice vaccines to be safe, affordable, and very effective, a real marvel of human ingenuity. It would therefore be a tragedy for the science to triumph only to be derailed by bad information and unfounded fear. The Dominican Freedom Party was early in its public support for the rollout and cautioned that partisan politics should be left out the administration of the vaccine be left to the health professionals. The DFP therefore continues to stand in solidarity with the scientific and medical communities who appeal to reason, data, and science in combating and defeating this ruinous disease. And so that's, that's our basic position. The, the, the Freedom Party believes itself to be a somber, a realistic party, uh, based, make decisions based on the best information available 
and realizes, I think, when it's necessary to, 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 to focus on the society as a community, as a community of, of individuals um, focused on seeking solutions. And that, that's the basic position that we take uh, in, in this going forward. We intend to, 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 to um, participate in the dialogue and to participate in doing whatever we can to bring facts to the, to the, to the society to make the right decisions. Uh, achieving herd immunity in our small island state is an important thing, and I think we all have to play a path to try to get, get to that point. Um, it, it is not acceptable that um, we, we, uh, we, we remain in shutdown mode, or we go into shutdown mode every three months, or we can't resume a certain level of economic productivity or quality of life. We must all cooperate to make that happen. I know we talk about freedom of choice, and of course, everyone has the choice to uh, decide on vaccination. But it's not that simple when you live in an interconnected society. It's not simply an independent decision, and we must face that reality. Uh, not everyone gets to choose what side of the road to drive on, else you'll have chaos. Uh, when you live in an interdependent society, there's interdependence that is uh, relationships and outcomes that are not dependent on any one person. It's interdependent outcome. And so that, that's what makes this a bit tricky, and we must take the right attitudes to so we can drive the right interdependent outcomes in this critical situation. Yes. Um, well, Jeff, you're gentlemen dealing with vaccine, and I heard you earlier on the during the day on the radio, I would think you would want to add something to this. Sure. Um, I'm, I just listened to the press briefing right before we get on, and just to reemphasize the importance of vaccination. Um, according to Dr. Ahmed, um, there are total cases of 45, and 42 is within the island, and three imported cases. Um, the thing to note here all the cases were unvaccinated according to his report and that um, the ages from 70 i think to somewhere 60 some um, i don't remember the exact age but somewhere in the 60s um here's the situation guys this is something i deal with i um we deal with the vaccines we we test them we look at them i have to admit that um at our lab um, in the us we were not able to have total access to astrazeneca vaccine the one that's in dominica um so i do not work a lot with it so i don't have a lot of information in terms of data with what what done on it myself but with our colleagues um just the information i think part of the trouble with the vaccination in dominica is that um i, I see why people are some hesitant i think when you have a government that necessarily not 100 percent transparent with the people it raises question but let me say this to the dominican public um vaccines work um there's a reason why we vaccinate um I'm in this field and I'm vaccinated and I believe it works. Um, what I explained earlier this morning is that there's a difference of being a carrier of the vaccine where it's symptomatic versus someone who get affected by, um, by the virus. Now, remember the virus itself is, is the reality that it's, it's not really like a, a very strong virus. The danger of the virus is the different variant strains and how um, easily it is to be transmitted. Um, it's highly contagious, and this is um, part of the problem with the with, with the vaccine. So I'm sorry, with the virus rather that is it is easily transmitted. Um, but we also have to ensure that we get people prepared and not scared. Um, in my hum humble opinion, um, 45 cases, yes, for dominant population look high. But here's here's the reality, folks. We have to educate the public about this and not to get them um, scared, but to get the public prepared. I don't believe necessary as much as I love the vaccine that the vaccine should be imposed on anyone, forcefully on anyone. But believe it or not, the vaccine is one of the best ways to help control the virus. So I strongly encourage people who are not vaccinated to get vaccinated. You may have health issues, you may have other religion beliefs and so on, and that's fine but I still feel it's one of the best weapons um, that we have. Another thing to note too, um, what, when we have those kind of rights cases, we have to face the reality. It's not everyone got the vaccine is going to die. Well over 80 plus percent of the people who got the virus survived it. Um, those at risk are really those who are, um, you know, 
uh, in compromised immune system. And that's why it's really good to have a good immune system. So this, th these are facts, um, science facts. I'm speaking here with work and data on myself. My only thing, the other thing I want to comment on quickly here is um, when things like that happen, we, we, um, there need to be more consultations. We cannot just go and shut the country down or just put curfew in place. You're not thinking right. As a matter of fact, I believe that the 6 p.m. curfew Monday to Friday is very difficult um, for people who are communicating from work in different communities to get to their homes. I think government need to rethink these things, and I, I, I would endorse an 8 p.m. curfew instead during the week. Because think about the guy who leaves work at 4 p.m. He have to stop at the bread place to get bread to close at 4 p.m. You know, how is he going to get food to eat in the morning? How is he? You know, we have to look at that. And some of the snack shops in the area, you totally shut them down. They don't have a chance, an opportunity in the evening, early evening to make a living. Who's going to compensate these people? Are they going to get some sort of stimulus package? Um, these are things we need to revisit. When you have a curfew, and there's a mention about um, livestock farmers, which is good, and farmers. Well, what about the fish of folks? Um, uh, what about, you know, like uh, Scott said, community, for example, when you have a curfew in place on, on, on Saturday, 5 p.m. till Monday, 6 a.m., those guys are doing fishing for a living. If the bonnet or, or, or you know, like the jacks come by, they, they can't even so long that they have to go. Are you going to compensate them for that? How are they going to feed their families? So I, I think before we rush into just putting cookies in place, there need to be more consultation. And I can guarantee the people of Dominica that the Freedom Party government, if in that situation we are Bernard Ito right now is the political leader of the party. We're not just going to let him put a curfew in place. He has to discuss with us. We, he has to have discussions with, with his ministers, um, um, stakeholders and shareholders that if he decides to just go and put a curfew on people, I can tell you, Mr. Ito, I'll start up and say to you, no, this doesn't happen that way. What about our people? Let's rethink this. And I know a political leader or a, a freedom party leader or was prime minister will not do such thing because history has proven itself in the past. So this is something I have to share like on, on for the moment. Um, also, yes, um, yes. Je yes I, I want to support um, Jeff 100%. My concern is the uneven way we've, we've which they were enforcing some of the regulations as it had to do with the spreading. Okay, in terms of large congregations of persons enjoying themselves in different areas. I felt it was poorly managed. You find persons close to the government would do whatever they want, and other persons will be in sanction. Now, one of the concerns that I have, and we as a party have to see how best to address it, is the hesitancy among the population. There's tremendous amount of information coming out based on the studies of vaccines. And we need to get our scientific community to address those fake news that, that being circulated. Because the fake news seems to circulate much faster than the other, other forms of information on the vaccine. We have the University of the West Indies. We have PAHO. Um, our, our Dr. HN is there. I think the University of the West Indies, um, through CARICOM, should be able to look at all the information being circulated and, and get our people to know what is correct and what is right, what is scientifically correct and what is wrong. Because most of the hesitancy sparks from information that I see. Um, some of it, if you, if you want to check it, and I would, I would ask persons when they see information come out to go on the individual's websites that they claim are the scientists putting all that information. And if you check it, you, you, sometimes you find that the very people they claim in are, are objecting to what they claim they said. Okay? And so you know right now it's fake news. So this hesitancy that persons have, we as a party need to recognize that and to appeal to our regional governments that we have Uni University of the West in the School of Medicine, MUNA, with a, a tremendous scientific experience there, and our scientific community, to ensure that news that has been circulated on the COVID is vetted, and when it's fake news, we notify people accordingly. And in each yes. territory, we have to address those, because a lot of the people are, are, are unaware of what is fake and what is not fake. Right, and, right. and some of these, some of this information, if you look at it, some of it is scientifically based. So we, we have to um, address that because, because, as Jeff said, 
the, the vaccine seems to be one of the one of the arms, arms that we have to fight this virus. Yeah, the issue is, Michael, um, you know, it's, it's more than just sharing the information. I mean, I mean, I certainly agree on that. The Foreign Party will play its, its part as a party, as a social organization to, to I, think, I think we have to champion this. We have to champion rationality. We have to champion right information. We have to get folks the information they need to make a right decision. I really believe that that has been poorly done. Um, it has not been a concerted effort to challenge bad information to get good information out so that people have the information to relay their fears. I mean, it's understandable to some extent that people who have bad information or thinking through this with bad information would be hesitant. I mean, it's, it's an understandable human trait. Completely agree that, that, that the government needs to do a whole lot more in terms of combating fake news and getting the right information out there so that people can make fact-based decisions. Um, but it goes beyond that to a certain extent. I mean, the, you can see what's happening around the world. Um, it's, it's, this, this is kind of a symptom of that. There is a certain, a re, there's a certain rejection of facts. There's a certain rejection of science. There's a certain rejection of rationality. Um, if you look at what happened in the Donald Trump era, for example, there was a certain rejection of fact-based thinking in the, in the United States and sort of, sort of irrational, emotional, uh, ideological, uh, you know, extreme religiosity type driven thinking. And that seemed to have swept across the world and, and has a bit, the ability to get thick information out there, or incorrect information out there, or opinions not based on scientific rational thought out there so easily. We are actually in a pivotal time in the world where, where we could actually face um, the degradation of society simply because bad information is not getting filtered out and we see bad outcomes from that um, bad outcomes are resulting from that and so it, 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 it's, it's a dominant issue we have to fight it we have to fight to purge this bad information and get good information in there but it's a worldwide phenomenon we have to be very concerned as a civilization as a global civilization as to how is it do we how, how do we fight back against people simply expressing views that are incorrect opinionated for their own benefit and for the old fear mongering fear monger and control of certain communities. Um, and that information just gets out there, and fear dominates. And this is a real, extremely important global question. <laughs> because, but, uh, 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 it's my call. Yeah, additionally, my concern is if we were to adhere to the basic principles of social distances, we are in a mass. We could minimize the transmission, but we have poor leadership in that because the government is silent when their people violate the basic principles of quarantining, ensuring that you come into Dominica and that you do not have the virus. They make some of their people pass. They, and the use of the back door for persons to come in the back door. We also have the we have been, our fishermen are selling um, fish to our neighboring French islands, where, where you have the variant virus of several variant viruses yeah. of COVID-19. Yes. What sort of protocol they're practicing? And these are some of the things that has to be addressed. And um, yes, I think the government has failed to show leadership, in particular, the ministers, because when their friends come in, they make excuses and get them to pass, and other people, you know, it, it's amazing. Yes, well, well, well I would the, say the level of politics that gets into that, and, and that has to be um, done with. Yes. I would say we should have a zero tolerance on backdoor entry. Absolutely. I think in fact, we should institute um, jail time for anyone, it, serious jail time for anyone caught in the, in the process of this. In fact, what we should, I, not even jail time in the sense of the normal jail, I think we should build a, a, a organize another jail. Because right. If you come and you may have COVID, you can't be among those. Well, well that's true. true. The normal jail was COVID. So I think we should have a zero torrent on back doors. I think people should warn their people. And a lot of persons work on back doors because they try to avoid going to quarantine, and you can't put people's life at risk. Now, the other thing, um, we early in the rollout of the vaccine, we did ask that the vaccine be left for the health professionals to administer. 
and that we should not, um, as parties, take any, if you like, any side for or against on the vaccine. We should all, as we really said this, this release, we just put out said, we should stand shoulder to shoulder and to figure out how we resolve the problem. Now, I mean, every Wednesday we come here, people will listen to us when they ask about the, the COVID and how people should not let their guards down and how they should safeguard themselves, do the various um, um, hygienic um, protocols that are in place for it and wear their masks and so forth. And I mean, I've never heard the Minister of Health or the Prime Minister or any person in the government compliment the opposition for the role that they have played. In fact, I heard the Prime Minister in Parliament this week um, when he was saying the opposition is happy that we have COVID. And why would you want as a Prime Minister to say that? Are you, are, are you trying to divide and rule? Now, you can't divide and rule in a COVID. Now, I heard the Minister... There's no winners. Yeah. Then I heard the Minister Ian Douglas made the point where the opposition leader was in a, a meeting in a, at the parish on Goodwill, and he said so many people would die out of COVID. Mm-hmm. And he challenged the member to stand up and speak. When the member stood up to speak, the very Ian said to him mm-hmm. that you have your turn to speak. Mm-hmm. So, so if we are leaders and we're not careful in our utterances, because we so hate right. opposition right. that we will say anything to make them look bad right. and to make, make us look good as government. At the end of the day, we're affecting the country. Absolutely, we're affecting the people. And I think that, that that's a, a lesson we have to learn. And the statement says we should stand shoulder by shoulder. There should be no call up no. No. when it comes to the COVID, fighting the COVID. No call up, no that, religion that, when it comes to fighting the COVID. If, if we are a mature society, Mature societies come together at times of crisis right. and stand together as mature communities to do the right things for the people. Mature communities put aside this political wrangling during the First World War, the Second World War, all the Western countries consolidated their internal differences and fought the end. And that's what mature societies do. And we as a mature and society our have enemies. to move our enemies to come oh, right. And we have to we have to come together internally to, to combat it. One more point on this before we move on. I, the, the, the point has been raised that I really think a lot of credit has got to go to the private sector, mm-hmm. who has insisted and complied and insisted on face masks and insisted on sanitization, and have done, in my, my view, a very outstanding job of, of applying uh, the law, or applying the requirements, uh, the, 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 uh, the protocols. And I think it's unfortunate that the, the, the government has not publicly recognized the private sector for doing such a bang of job in ensuring that uh, those protocols are followed. Um, again, and we, we want to take this opportunity to to, to thank it and to rec- and to commend and to recognize. In fact, in fact, they want to job the private sector. In fact, they invest Absolutely. by buying dispensers. They, they do lots of things, they hire additional people at the door. At the door. And so it's, it's just been an outstanding and, job. And I think they're the number one reason. And the banks, the banks as well, you see people as soon as, as, as um, somebody needs to tell her, right. somebody comes and wipe and you know, right. sanitize. Right. That, that is fantastic. And I think the, the only thing I find though is, I don't know, know if we have to standardize the, the what do you call that? The dispensers. No, the sanitize. Okay. The sanitizer the, bottle. Yeah, yeah. Whatever they use it. Whatever they use. Because sometimes you go to some places and if you use something that's not very nice <laughs> and cut it up in your hand, you go to other places, it gets like sticky. Uh-huh. And I mean, your whole hand of you want to get out to wash it and so on. Right. So, and, and even sometimes it scratches your hand as well. Right, right. There so, is a lot of variety. Variety. Is, exactly, yeah. But, but all in all, you know, they, they, they don't understand the job and, and we, we want to recognize them. One of the things that happens with the Labour Party, the idea of the administration, is they simply almost seem to be have an allergy to recognize anyone else beside themselves. As, as doing something productive for the society. Nobody else. Did. Everything must seem to flow from the bosoms of the Labour Party as the the messiahs, the saviors, the, the be all and end all. <laughs> and, and they have a problem <laughs> simply saying thank you to so, the, to to the, to the um, so, private sector and, and recognize and it. And, and this, this is a real pernicious, this is this is a malady that we, 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 we face with, with the government. Mr. Party leader, that just yes, shows, uh, shows the juvenile leadership of the present administration. You know, very juvenile, want to beat their chest for everything. But when they 
violate the protocol rules, like the Prime Minister coming from Venezuela, high risk place, going to a funeral the following day. You know, um, what penalties for him? But if a poor man doesn't have his mask, 5000 I, I think he said $5,000. But what about when a minister who we pay a salary to enforce protocols that have persons violating it, and some of them even sponsoring some of the, the CEOs that are violating it, like even um, elected officials, like on the, uh, on the river bank, and those sort of things. We have some yeah. serious problems and juvenile management and arrogance in, in, in relating to persons' comment on what, comments on what they're doing. And that yes, is that okay. that is poor leadership. Yes, Jeff, want to say something? Yeah. Right. I, I just want to. You, you made a very good point, Mr. Boston, about um, the whole issue of not giving credit. We don't. I, I remember very clearly when the COVID thing started. Um, the Freedom Party and You program. Uh, I I remember I was one of the guests, and we other people as well with the scientific background, and the recommendations we made right on this program. Some of them laughed. And the very same recommendation that we made, they eventually realized we are on point. And we had the research. Um, and for people who are listening, we didn't, it was just not me. There's people on the Freedom Party team who are medical doctors and who are researchers, who are scientists. We came together, we made these recommendations on this program, and they were researched. And for one to say their position, don't do anything unhappy this COVID. I mean, this is a very, very, very useless statement. And, and this, this is totally unacceptable. Even when the, the national nutritionist was asked questions about what is probiotic, I remember I called and helped her. Could not even mention some of those probiotic names, simple things like lactobacillus, artodophilus, and KCI, and, and bifidum, and so on. We educated the people about the probiotics they should be taking. We recommended. This is our field. This is what we did. And it went unnoticed. And unfortunately, shortly after we make recommendations that the 14-day quarantine is not necessary, that really after you take your PCR, you do your PCR test, we believe after five days on the island, if you do a PCR test and you're negative, you stay two days after for seven days, you should not be able to, you should be fine to be in the country. Someone who's non-Dominican, based on his accent, I don't know skin color what, made the very same recommendation we made and they upheld it like he's a king and this is the problem i'm having in this country that we have local people who are educated who work in this field making recommendations and they're totally ignored based on the platform they use to bring the message and those people who don't have the experience and they come from somewhere else they just uplift them and folks i want to say this to this evening i still believe when you come to dominica a PCR test is what I recommend. I still believe people coming to Dominica should do a PCR test after the second day on arrival because the antigen test, is, it's, it's a good test. It's okay, but it doesn't give you accurate results. As I explained, an antigen test is very much like if you take a pregnancy test. There are women who can tell you that they have missed the period for two, three months and they think they're pregnant. They go and they do a, a quick pregnancy test, very similar like the antigen test, and it gives them a negative result. Well, Guess what? They realize they are pregnant. So there are days because of the of what we call the media it is, is the liquid formation that they put in those tests. It's sometimes if the batch is not properly mixed. It's just like if you make orange juice, my friend, and you don't squeeze all the pulp out, you're going to have some pulp in the orange juice. If you don't mix the sugar properly, go in the solution, you're going to have that. So sometimes those tests, this is why you have some false negative and false positive. So that's why I strongly recommend PCR, QPCR, real time PCR. And for the kind of money we have in this country, it's more than time the government invests in a QPCR machine. Yes, they are like about between a hundred and four hundred thousand dollars US. But you know what, Mr. Boston, I'm going to see how we can work with the Freedom Party to see with our friends in the US if we can even get a way to get the government some sort of PCR test machine. Because if the one we have broke down, now what? These are the areas we need to invest, my friend, and stop talk nonsense, and let's stop that division between skin color and political party scholars. This is an effort. 
We must all come together and come back together. And that's the only way we're going to move this country forward. We cannot afford to keep Dominica short. My sister will make bacon and chicken. She's shut down for a week. What's going to close? Who's going to, who's going to give a stimulus package? She's not going to get the honor of that. Sure. We it's have to. We have, we have some things to do. Yeah. Time is running on us. So, uh, yes. Okay. Um, the thing is, we have so much to say here. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason why, and the fact that we're not here every Wednesday, put a little pressure on the once a week program. So the parliament. We're doing whatever we can to bring it back. Now, we have another situation in Parliament. Um, it requires some discussion. We also want to look at the 2021 2022 national budget, as was just concluded in Parliament um, this week. And um, what the Parliament thinks is so critical, both of them. And so I just want to quickly, and we can discuss also on some other time, to say that the camaraderie I am accustomed to. Parliament in Dominica has all gone, and it's gone for the worst. What we have seen is, is, is a level of arrogance and level of um, division and bitterness in our parliament, and the government is doing nothing to help it, to help the situation. I mean, the prime minister is the leader of the house, the speaker is the chairman of the um, parliament, and the speaker, I mean, have to be a professional Yes, you support your party. You may have a little off and on politics there and there, but this blatant political abuse and mischief that we are seeing displayed from this speaker is a disgrace. I mean, even Alex Boyd Knight, I would give her a Passover on this present speaker, frankly speaking. I mean, she was a disaster. Right. But I give her that disaster, right. a, a, a pass over this. So total, disaster. Yes, it's a disaster we have. Because you ought to be able to put some order, order in the house. And don't be afraid. You know what I've seen? There was a member of the opposition on the floor one time in Parliament. And he wanted some more time. And he asked a, a colleague of his there to 10 more minutes. So the colleague still got move a motion for 10 more minutes. And the speaker said, Those in favor? All the government side said, No. Those against? No. Those in favor? Those in favor? His colleague said, yay. Yeah. And those against, all the government said, I said, said no. Right. And as the prime minister walked in, he said, what, what happened there? You may want some more time? Uh -huh. And he said, yes, one, give me some more time. And he moved a motion. Right. And then give me 10 minutes. And the very members right. who That's said no, voted yes, yes. Yes, yes. And I said, but how can that happen? Right. Right. They voted yes. And the same way, I mean, if it's missing there, and I see no reserve time, mm -hmm. and I vote no reserve time. Right. And the prime minister come and I vote no. Of course. I vote no. I don't we're, want to check my vote. I mean, you're a human being. You're a human being. You're a leader. You're a leader. You're, you're a member of parliament. You're That's what you are. You're in your community. You know, you like, 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 like when I was growing up as a boy, there was when you're carrying bananas on a truck, you have fellas on the tailboard. It looked like this is how these guys are. Well, we on the tailboard of parliament, and they don't make any effort to get out there. But the point I'm making, though, and I made the point on on Loftus' program this morning. I was short because he said he had to move on, but a number of persons called me on WhatsApp and, and, and right. they were very pleased with what I said. And I said, when we're in Parliament, we organized, Freedom Party government organized for members of Parliament who did not have transportation to get to their homes. Right. The other paper and all the documents of Parliament would be dropped to your home, weeks in advance mm -hmm. of Parliament by the police. And there are a number of police officers who were involved, who know themselves. And they used to go around and drop members, and um, even Durand, the late, in, in, in Pivot Soufrier, yeah, that area there, you have um, Sanders in Castle, who's there to drop, Mrs. Um, Mayor so rest in Peace, um, Gertrude Roberts, mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. home, yeah. Alexis Williams, Mayor so at his home, James Story, right. they used to drop them at their home. That level of camaraderie. We debate, yes, I remember Mike Douglas in the parliament debating, and, and, as soon as um, the debate is over, he comes and say, um, I, I agree to you today, I, I, I right. agree to you. Right. You feel right. it? Right. So, so, so you left the parliament as a member of parliament representing people. Right. Now, right. now the parliament, now you live there with anger, with right. bitterness because of the debate. Can you imagine the prime minister of the house, sat in the house, or rather he completed a mo uh, his contribution on presenting the budget. When he was finished, Minister 2, normally the House of the Journey, 
Minister Two. He moved a motion to give all to to, to um, what do you call that? Suspend Rule Forty One. Right. That the operation that have sent them he had in presenting. Right. Every one of, every minister one hour, right. and other members half an hour. He moved right. that. Right. As Prime Minister Leader of the House. Right. To now, what end? You yeah. ask. Ask. Answer. Then, then, he came, when he finished that activity, the opportunity leader was not there. Right. But in his absence, he did that as Prime Minister. He allowed Ian to speak. And 10 minutes in Ian speaking, the agenda was the next day. And the next day, he came to the parliament, spoke with the speaker, and spoke with Castle Neal up here. And Castle Neal, and then left. And Castle Neal a motion now. As the speaker said, they move another motion to undo what the leader of the house did. So they don't realize is, is what Kasmi have done is to show say that the prime minister was out of order right. to amend Rule 14. That was the yeah, Absolutely. They feel it's a blow to the opposition, but it's a blow to them by the senator, right. new young minister, is saying that the prime minister was out of order right. to, to have to move right. a motion yes. to give it all time. So he resent the motion. And they make a big guru about that, and then you something, the police came in. The when parliament is meeting, the Southern Arms is the one responsible for the policing around the parliament. Okay. And every police officer there is under his command. Right. And if something is happening, the speaker asks you to escort a member, or you don't ask you to want to put a member, beat a member, to escort a member out. Now I see Southern Arms, you need some training, you need some discipline, pick up the bag of you. Of uh, look, yeah, no, right. I saw him look, look at his mask, right. so I got the impression he was with his mask, not to move out. Right. But it's another, I'm um, pick up his bag, so he pick up my bag, obviously, right. he put me in a rage, right? But you, right. you, you handled my property, and then now JS went out, and then like, you heard, I do see, but you heard the rest it's of the police came there, and then the, 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 immediately the commissioner of police came in and the deputy, so they didn't they, come in because, because they have no rights there. What I suspected did is to test themselves as to how they can have a coup on parliament. How far can they push it? Push it, yes. But so it's basically, and as you, as you pointed out, where, where we're going is the civilian leadership, which is the parliament in the country, is the supreme authority of the country. And civilian leadership is very necessary to, to have a mature and um, progressive society. Mm -hmm. And when you have civilian uh, leaders, at the parliament level, which is the, the, the highest level of government, in fact, being subordinated to uh, military men, for lack of a, a better word, um, you have a very bad precedent being set. That's and right. so, so, so again, we, we, we demonstrate that we are not taking our civic uh, responsibilities and our civic education seriously. That the government is not acting as a mature government that respects the rules and respects the norms of decency. And, and the maturity in, in, in which a, a, a democracy must operate. And so that's a very tragic thing. And one asks oneself, but to what end did the prime minister need to do this? Mm -hmm. Why was this necessary? What necess necessitated this? Um, what, what is his, his goal here? And um, if it's purely to be punitive to the, uh, to, the, to the leader of the opposition, that's a very childish thing to do at that level. Mm -hmm. at that responsibility, in that forum, to display that you simply want to be a boy and get one over on another man to prove that you're the bigger man, what is this? Yeah. Is this is this the high school school yeah. in a modern society? In a modern society, what is going on here? Does Mrs. Kerry not have better things to do than mess with the a waste time, time, a waste time and be better be, to be doing petty childish things? Mm -hmm. So I mean, this, this, and, and then his argument about, you know, he's speculating he's doing this because the, the leader of the opposition was not here, but he's never listened yes. to the leader of the opposition in many, many debates. He walks out, he, walks out. he shows no um, respect, um, and which is which is something else. Someone else does it, and he flies into a rage. He shows you he has a certain, he has gone off the rails to some extent mm -hmm. in his, his arrogance mm -hmm. in, how, in how he thinks about himself. Yeah. But, but the leader, I see a fundamental problem with how we view parliament. Parliament is representative. People who go to parliament to debate, 
issues, go and represent the people. That is where we go to meet the people and to tell them what laws we're going to pass for them, how we're going to spend their money, how we're going to manage their money, how we're going to improve their health care and so forth. But apparently, the Speaker believes that he has more right than the elected parliamentarians to represent the people. The Prime Minister believes that he can deprive the opposition to speak to the people in Parliament. What I think happened was the Prime Minister gave the leader of the opposition equal time. And when somebody told him, somebody must have told him, boy, uh, you know the leader of the opposition going to hit you blues on this CBI money, the $4.2 billion and whatnot and whatnot and whatnot. He felt that that was too much time. And like a little boy, he sought to use the young gentleman to, to, to deal with that. Yes. And, and I think if you had a president who was not a politician, he would have called in the prime minister and talked to him. But that president was a minister to the anger with persons who didn't support the Labour Party. And tomorrow he was president. How can he now censure a little boy prime minister who is, who, who is playing games? Yes. Michael, what, what, what I want us to do, because the time on our stage is already wrapping up, I'm right. going to allow the party leader to make some comments on the budget, and we can just take the discussion, all of it, into, into one, if you understand. But, so, but, but so just one, one thing yeah. I want to say to close this matter. I feel that something has to be done to the, attorney, the, the, the Polish Chief Attorney General for sending armed forces into the Parliament. Because these police have no right there. It was a coup on the people in Parliament. Because for you to go to Parliament as a police officer, you have to come under the authority of the Sergeant of Arms and train to, to, to deal with those matters. Right. And that, I it's think, it's was a, a clear violation of the people in Parliament. It's certain additional issues that we'll be looking into, Michael, as, as you're aware. So this is not the end of the conversation, or the, or the discussion around that. There's a lot to be said. The sanctity of civilian governance, the sanctity of, uh, you know, respecting and honoring the institutions that we hold sacred in our society is something, some, the, the conversation has to be. But to threaten but the life, of, to threaten the life of an elected official in yes, parliament, absolutely. that is a criminal offense. It's, it's to threaten an individual to anywhere is wrong. It's illegal. Yes, it but my and you as a police officer to go and threaten a parliamentarian who was elected to represent the people yes, in the yes, people's absolutely. chamber? Yes. It's, a, okay. it's an issue that has to be, 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 be looked into for the mm -hmm. All right, let's give it a bit to uh, looking at the, uh, the, 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 the budget address. And we'll be putting out some formal response to it here, but I think you know, we can paint the general picture of, of, of how we view this the budget and, uh, and our initial thoughts on this. Um, the, the way we sort of frame this is to look at the budget almost as a, a coded document, a coded document that allows you, if you can look at it carefully, to decode and to analyze the underlying uh, goals, or maybe the unstated goals, versus the stated ones, and also the sort of attitudes and beliefs that the, um, the budget reveals. Um, often, when you look, you look, at, look at those documents, um, there's masking, a lot of masking that goes on. But if you're, you're a careful observer, you can pull back the veil, and you can hopefully judge the underlying motivations, beliefs, and, and unstated goals that are important. And so that's the sort of analytical lens that we, we want to bring through this budget, the 2020 21 budget and, uh, and, and analyze it in that manner. Um, now, we could go through this budget line by line, but I, I do not think that's a good, necessarily the best approach. And it's mm -hmm. just, the time is short, okay. and it really, we could also lose the forest from the trees, but lose the pattern of the reality of, of, of what's going on by, by doing that mind and exercise. So, I think what we'll do is we'll just pick a few key observations and comment on, on what they reveal about the mind of the uh, DLP-led administration. 
So let's look at that first of, of the claim of the government that they are very interested in human capital development. I mean, they have said, and the budget states, that 11.8% of the budget goes to education. And that shows that human capital development is a prior priority for the government and it's listed through the budget in several places, right? Prior human capital development is very important to us. We're concerned about that. That is a key pillar of, of, of our, uh, our, our policy. But is that goal truly authentic? Let's pull back the curtain a little bit. First, most of the budget is slated for physical infrastructure, right? School building and so forth. And while getting students into classrooms is important, um, it's not clear that the current administration fully grasps that schooling is, does not necessarily and automatically translate into education. Certainly, schooling is a way to education, but if you don't do schooling well, you will not get the outcome, which is education. Education is an outcome. Are you an educated citizen? And so, if you look at the budget, the only thing that seems relevant is those physical infrastructure to, 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 to um, address school. Um, but for schooling, as I said, to be relevant, we need creative, knowledgeable, relevantly skilled, and I said relevantly skilled citizens coming out of the, at the, at the other end of the pipe of, of school. If we can do that, then we have effective education and human capital development. But in this budget, and in all other budgets that I've examined from the administration, there is scant mention of investments and plans to develop a curriculum that's more relevant to the needs of, of Dominica as a developing country. Where are the programs? Where is the, where is the ideas? Where are the ideas? Where, where is the investment and the programs to, to, to transform what is now a colonial era education into a 21st century education? Where, where is the investment and the plans and discussion around transforming our, 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 our curriculums into a 21st century one. Um, we know that the world is moving into data and dig digital skills, and yet, um, budget after budget, there is no mention of actually how we can accomplish that. So at the secondary school level, we see a, a, a fundamental lack of understanding of the, of the administration and what education truly is, um, and how that translates into human capital. But that continues at the tertiary level as well. The, the administration caps itself on the back a lot of on being the champion of, of university scholarship programs. But the scholarships programs that scholarships are awarded without an understanding of where the future is, is headed. And, and, and not developing strategic plans to get there, right? And not proactively training the aluminum resources to actualize those plans. And it does not as well issue scholarships in a manner that encourages and retains the best talent. Because it's awarded based on political affiliation, a family, political affiliation, and so forth. And so a lot of the island's best human capital is become sidelined. Nor does the government show, it says, but it does not truly show that it truly views and respects university students as partners in national development. If you look at the callous, rude, and dismissive remarks of, of the leadership of the administration, you will see this. Asking young, young women to shake their behinds or accusing students in Cuba of being greedy brands, it shows, that the under, shows the underlying beliefs about our educated talent. So when you put all that together, you pull back that veil, and the, the government says, we are interested in creating and promoting and developing the human capital in Dominica. Um, that is not the true goal. At least there is no plans to achieve that true goal. The true goal, in my mind, seems to be simply to sell the idea of being the champion of education in order to cement political advantage. So it's about political advantage. And so the, if the superficial look of building some school buildings and doing some of the things um, will win political support, but the true goal it exposes that we are want to build human capital on the island is, is, is lacking. So that's one area. Um, if you look at the budget again, one of the big areas it talks about, at least it tries to be innovative, is, is in promoting a digital economy. But again, does the budget show, and its commentary, and its, its analysis, and its plans and programs show that the government, the current administration, truly understands what it takes to bring about a digital economy. 
it, it, there's a 75 million dollar investment intended to do so but much of that money is earmarked for digitizing the records of government enabling electronic transactions and while this has value due to very limited understanding for the digital economy so i don't want to monitor uh, you know monopolize the discussion also so if you want to jump in and have a few comments at that point i'll stop it Yes, well, uh, well, well, yes well, well, to say though, when you listen to the presentation of the budget by the Prime Minister, it's almost like he comes with the same argument, the same objective issue. And the objective is not to grow the economy, create jobs, make people independent. Um, in, in, first of all, for housing, for example, it's always good if the government can assist in providing housing for those who need housing. But also you have to encourage the private sector and individuals, as well as the banks, to um, participate in the housing needs of the country. And it is better if the government itself develop what you call a revolving fund. So a person who gets a house from the government the house from the government that they'll find out what was your rent before you got that house from the government. My rent was six hundred dollars a month. It's okay, pay us three hundred a month. Um, pay to that area, or go to the bank there, or pay it here, and you get a receipt each time you pay. So from six hundred to three hundred, you have an additional hundred um three hundred dollars that you can use to pay your bills. You have to pay your bills, electricity, telephones, and what have you. And at some point in your life, that house becomes your house. So you are independent now. You can take that house and manage that house later on for the benefit of your family. Right. If something happened to you, you can pass it on to your family. But as it stands now, while you may be happy you're in a house, and the Prime Minister celebrates that the government gives you a house, but at the end of the day, the house will be gone. Right. So, so, so you will, you will leave, say for example, you get into the house, say you are 20, you are 25, you are 30. You may live in that house up to 60, it's not your house. It is, it has that improved your life? Whereas if for 10, 15, 20 years, you pay, is like a mortgage, and that house becomes yours. I know people in Bathurst, I remember lady, you know, when, Freedom Party came in and the house in Buffett State was damaged by Hurricane David. Nobody knew who to repair the houses because nobody was paying, and therefore government decided, well, if nobody was paying, then who is responsible to repair the houses down during the hurricane? So the Prime Minister, Ms. Charles, said, government will, will repair the houses and will make money available that people can take a loan and pay for the houses. I remember when he said to me, Boston, he said to me, Bat one. We buy a child bush and we buy a and we buy a bush. But later in her life, she realized the value of that. Because she could mortgage that very house to sell a lot of the stuff. You see, it's from making. Exactly. So it's the right policy. The right policies is what is this added value in terms of how you as a person become independent. You own something. Let's put it that way to that tomorrow. You find the government forming the food. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, you know something, I have a right to choose, like St. Lucia did. Right. The government will have a right to choose me out of government, I choose you out of the house. Right, right. And that's just not the way it should be. It should be. And, and, and the Prime Minister made a statement right. when they would be in the, the, in the house in and, um, Bellevue Chopin, when he said, um, I, I put in a house to keep me in the house. Right, right. Now, and but, that, that, that. But, yeah. but you don't know, owe that to the Prime Minister. No. Okay? That is personal money. In fact, because he was, before he was Prime Minister, he could not even give you a drink. Right, right. Tell us to give you a house. Absolutely. I don't know if so. Jeff, I see Jeff and Max Mike, and Michael. Well, you cannot see me, Johnson. <laughs> I can't see you, though, but I'm hearing you. Okay, let, you, I, I let me tell you, you in, in support of what party leader is saying, by my view on the um, budget is, where is the development plan that we go, that go into on full? What, where is the skills forecasting? Because if you're going into a digital economy, how long does it train people to be ready 
to work in a di digital economy. You have to focus when you go in into that to train the people way ahead. So by the time you get the resources for the digital economy, then the people will be ready. It's like the coffee plant. He got a coffee plant, never planted coffee so that they can crush the coffee. And to this day, we haven't had a cup of coffee from the coffee plant. So I, I think he, he likes to have a budget that looks huge, sophisticated to the unknown, people who, who are unaware. And at the end of the day, where is he meet? You have a house that you value and you project growth of $300,000 for an apartment. In actual fact, maybe 100000 goes into the apartment. So the economy is shrinking, but the expenditure for the houses are not contributing to the development of the people or the, the gross domestic product. Somebody is making that money outside of Dominica because you have wanted maybe going to the promoters and, and developers and one foot going to the construction companies who are totally foreigners. What happened to our local people to have the spillover effect that will bring development? So the budget is supposed to be designed to show us how we're going to stimulate the economy, employ our people and bring development. And I don't see that in that budget. True, true. And there, there are a couple um, more points I think we should make here on, on, on the budget. And, and you raised the point about the digital economy and, and forecasting skills forward. It's absolutely true. There's another critical point of that. And it, 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 it impacts not just only the digital economy, it impacts all innovative projects that this government undertakes, as you mentioned, the coffee factory and so forth. But here's the thing. You can't build an innovation-driven innovation uh, creative economy around sort of values and attitudes that the Labour Party government brings to, to bear, right? It takes a certain social environment. It takes a certain collegial attitude. It takes a certain collaboration and trust. It takes a certain allowing of free expression. It takes a certain uh, amount of diffused authority. It takes a level of, of compressing a hierarchical organization into a flat organization where you have a lot more people who have a lot more authority to do things. But if you look at it, the, the, the very beliefs that are very toxic to creating an innovation or technical economy are the very attitudes and values that the Labour Party government brings to bear, right? They're authoritarian. They, they, they restrict for expression, not encourage it. They, they're top-down authoritarian, not team-based. And they, 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 they give opportunity based on pull strings, not merit. And all of those values and attitudes are, are, are extremely detrimental to developing any sort of innovation, technical, high-tech driven kind of uh, economy. And that's why the government cannot and has not been successful in implementing any sort of innovation driven economic development mm -hmm. because they simply do not have the right values approach in order to ex exhibit that they understand the sort of social environment that is necessary to enable that ecosystem that ecosystem of, of free expression, free creativity, and investing in people regardless of political strife. <laughs> and that, that's that, that a real detriment to any sort of creative economy or digital economy that the government talks about. And none of that is addressed in the budget. There is no mention of awareness or investment in programs to build the right social environment to, to get that economy. Yes. Do you have a different uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Chairman, um, the budget, there are a few things I looked at, um, and there are um, a few little things they do, they try. But they had this pre budget debate, and a guy that was the director of audit made a comment on, um, I think it was on DBS, that people are complaining about the CBI program. But if it's not the CBI program, like three, four hundred million dollars would not be in part of the budget. I mean, when you make a statement like that, and on behalf of the government. I say to you, shame on you. You need to check yourself when you went to the bathroom, did you wipe properly before you get back in public? Shame on you. Because you are saying to me, you have more creative ideas. If it's not passport, you can't grow an economy. That, when I heard this statement, I was, if I'm the prime minister of finance, I would be putting my 
a paper bag over my face if I come to contact with this guy. You cannot tell me if you cannot sell passport, you cannot, you cannot have money in the budget. That's a shame. Now, the flip side of the budget I like, that we, we, it took us some hard work. We've been talking about agriculture. It took us years of hard work right into the Ministry of Agriculture, right into the Ministry of Finance, right into Customs. And finally, they did give a, 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 a VAT exam on hatching eggs, which in the first time should have been there, but somebody make a boo-boo, but they fixed the problem. So I want to say this is a good thing. And we want to be with the Freedom Party, when I'm on this program, I, we like to talk about, not just me, but the group here, we like to talk about the good things, when something's good, say it's good. I think this is a good move, but guess what? Despite that, how much money did you put into agriculture into young farms? If you really want to grow the poultry industry or the livestock industry, I remember the Freedom Party government every year in budget, if they decide they're gonna give agriculture a big part of the pie, and Mr. Boston, subject to correction on that, you've been in parliament yeah, during the Freedom Party government. Another year, they will probably give, let's say health, a big piece of the pie. Every budget is the same nonsense. While you, we appreciate the Val example, and we want to encourage the farmers, Dominica, to continue to support the local hatchery, continue to support um, the, the, the local product on the market, and that this VAT exam will bring some funds into your pocket as a local farmer as we try to work with you. But what I'm saying is, why didn't you get money aside for agriculture through the skills training program um, into young people to encourage them to get into agriculture? Why didn't you get money? Um, let's say if you decide this you want to do agriculture, get all young people trained look at how we can reduce this bill how many people in dominica know we are importing over seven million us dollars on chicken into dominica how many dominicans know that now if you invest in the farmers to look at that sector you are doing so many good things one you are reducing your import bill of on on poultry from seven million us dollars you are creating just between the young people you are providing food security you are producing a local product that is organic and healthy to eat these are the significant changes that need to be made in the budget that when you're investing in your young people find a way to create new opportunities for young people it's just like this whole thing of the digital economy i mean we have a digital economy and some of the government places don't even accept a credit card i mean for christ's sake I, I, so many to talk about i know also people might be trying to call and and ask questions and a lot but i just want to touch on the surface of that <laughs> what have been your thoughts on that no no very very good points jeff um and well, actually the, the point that you raised is um goes to the heart is a good segue into the final comment i want to make on the budget if you look at the budget carefully you will see that the government simply and fundamentally does not understand wealth creation the, 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 the government simply does not seem to understand where wealth comes from. The government, in fact, in the preamble to the to the um, to, in the preamble to the um, budget, um, they, they say they very frankly, the reality is that small island developing states like Dominica have limited resources and restricted fiscal space, and therefore their approach is the only thing we can do is we have the way of limited resources, restricted fiscal space. End of story. What we need to do is to sell passports, to block the gaps, and to keep a static condition and to keep us on, 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 on life support, because that's all we can do as a society. Really, if you approach your nation with that mindset, where you think that we have limited capabilities, limited resources, and restricted fiscal space, that is the mental model that you bring to the you will, what will you see? You will see the exact set of programs being rolled out that the government has been pushing all along. But the wealth does not come from natural resources per se. Japan is a very wealthy country, one of the wealthiest in the world, and it has almost no natural resources. What it does have is the intelligence, creativity, passion, and hard work of its people. And that is what this, this DLP-led administration needs to understand. We have Bondless resources, they're tied up in the neural structures of our minds. They're, 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 it's bound up in the intelligence, the knowledge to do things, the creativity, the innovation that's in your people. And when you invest in that, that is the best natural resource available. We can transform our country into a first world country if only the government would understand that fundamental resource of, of where wealth comes from. 
you could start with a pile of sand on the beach. And to one person, it could be a pile of sand, but to someone with knowledge and information necessary to transform the pile of sand, the silicon in the pile of sand, into microchips, could win the difference between selling the pile of sand for $200 or selling the silicon which you have trans use knowledge to transform into a microchip for so millions and millions of dollars. And so the government has a fundamental misunderstanding of, of uh, what it is that creates wealth. And that is one of the most fundamental problems that is, is, is affecting us as a country. Well, um, but Michael, I, I, Michael, one I, second. I, one second, okay. Michael. One second. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, that, is, that is the situation that is um, it's a dismal situation. When you, when, you, when you get to that point, the government thinks that the only way to uh, sell, uh, to, to make things work then, is to sell over birthright. Simply sell passports. It's an easy, lazy way to raise money. They're not going to be fundamentally important what we need to do to, to create wealth indigenously from indigenous innovation, from, from, from investing in people and giving people a level playing field that everyone, regardless of political strike, will join their hands together into realizing a vision of a 21st century modern economy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very, very bad thing. And the, 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 if you look at the budget one more time, there's another fundamental lesson to, to be learned here. Beyond them not understanding where wealth creation comes from, they do not understand the concept of opportunity cost. Because repeatedly, the government says in several areas, this is of no cost to the taxpayer. This is of no cost to the taxpayer. This will have no cost. But there is no such thing as a pre lunch. Mm -hmm. In every instance where they say this is of no cost to the Dominican society, it's of extreme cost, opportunity cost. Because when you sell your passport really nearly, what is the opportunity cost of that? First of all, you dilute your indigenous population's right and legacy of, of, of inheritance of this island. You could have a situation where very wealthy people come in with these passports and essentially dominate your economic uh, sphere and, and you become almost an appetite society. The, 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 the possibility of that is a huge opportunity cost. The opportunity cost to, to uh, if some of these characters are unsavory and get onto the world scene and do things like terrorism or other acts, the opportunity cost to the to the to the, 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 the name of Dominica, to the to the to the, the sanctity, to the reputation, you no know, damage of the island is a huge opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost to take a billion dollars and invest it in the airport, and that's a different discussion. But let just let's assume we took that billion dollars and we invested it into data analytics, agriculture, tourism, uh, cloud computing, all the aspects of moving our country to a 21st century economy, taking the money to build an airport is a huge opportunity cost where you, 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 you forego investing that money. I have no doubt that a billion dollars invested strategically in smart industries can transform this, the, the economy of this country dramatically and, and take us into to the next level. And so those statements by the government of no cost, no cost, and touting that and boasting that is actually shows a profound lack of understanding of opportunity cost. Um, you combine that with the lack of understanding of uh, you know where wealth creation comes from, and you have a very dysfunctional set of policies uh, being presented here in this in this budget. Yes, yes, my God. Uh, particularly the, the point I wanted to make, the fundamental point is the lack of understanding of what it is for a government to create wealth for its people, to generate wealth, by, by utilizing the resources, which basically is the people raising their skills to ensure that they can produce world-class products and improve their lives and raise their self-esteem that they feel they're contributing to their development. What the government sees as wealth creation is wealth creation for them. How their friends and them can get the maximum from the resources of the people. When you sell a passport, you get a 40,000 commission. That is the sale person selling the passport. 40,000 US per passport sold. You, the government said their friends will send a band down to do this for election time and so. And that is what they see. They do not see the creation of an economy 
that is self-sustaining, that can bring employment to their people, and not employment like NEP employment, employment that pays money that they can support their family and save some money so that they can send their children to college later on. So right. there's a fundamental understanding. Also, most of their projects, let's look at Kapinski. What plan was there? You going to put a hotel in a uh, um, reserve, a natural reserve. The laws are there. You need planning permission. You did not go and adjust the laws so that you can, what sort of projects you can put in a reserve to preserve the reserve for the people and or what not and what not. You just put it there without planning permission and you didn't even ensure that you know how to bring people in for the hotel. So, you know, there's no plan. So these are the kinds of the fundamental problems, the regulations that were not followed. And these are the fundamental problems with this administration. They do not understand development, people development. They understand their personal development. And that is their focus. And if you don't toe that line, you find yourself in serious problems with them. Yes. Uh, well, Jeff, the point about the the uh, removing of that on hatching eggs, which is is good because there's already no VAT on chicken. Um, so Barbados can bring the chicks here, pay no VAT, right. and no duty, right. and they can compete with you, right. who those locally who yeah. has to pay VAT. So, yes, so, so what do you think of it? I mean, the Bajans are after the chicken, the chicks in Barbados, they come to Dominica, no VAT, no duty, and there's no duties on eggs, yes, but there is VAT. So removing the VAT is a sensible thing that I think had to be done. And I just want, because I'm involved with the hatchery as well with Jeff, I just want to family farmers and those who are patronizing who's supporting the need for this um, hatch to grow. Because I mean, I can say here, and Jeff is here, he can think St. Lucia is inviting the hatchery to come to St. Lucia. St. Vincent inviting the hatchery to come to St. Vincent. It's a small hatchery. Even Grenada talking is a small hatchery, but there's potential for it to grow. And a group of that um, hatchery is also a group of jobs, a group of um, providing um, food security and providing chicken meat for population. Jen made the point that if everything grows and the farmers are supported to expand their business and to do real business, then what happens is that it reduces our import bill, and that is good for the country. Absolutely. Now, I listen to Ian Douglas because my understanding of a budget is the reason why you have and all as a minister. It's not a new thing, it's something that has been happening since Freedom Party was in government. And the reason for all as a minister is that you have a ministry to report on. And you ought to come there and say, the last budget, my ministry received $10. And out of that $10, this is our, our projection was so and so, so and so, and we have achieved 80%, 90%, 95%, 100%. 100%. And the new allocation to my ministry in this new financial year will take us there. Right. But to me, they spend a whole hour talking rubbish. And you listen to Ian, it's the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. And what, the, the, the amazing thing about that, you know, they still ask you for more time. Mm -hmm. They stand, but they have, the, they have the, the audacity right. to stand on their two feet and ask for more right. time. And you, you see they have to represent the ministry. So when you represent your ministry, Fairly and report, then you talk about your constituency because your constituency also will have needs and so forth. And you show where, as a parliament, where you have achieved and what left to be done. In right. But they spend more time saying what the opposition should do. And can you imagine the reason why a party replaced another party is because the people recognize the party failed to do what they wanted to do. Right. So they voted out and put somebody else in. After 20 years, you are still there repeating what was not done. Yes. It shows us it was in a swamp of mud, yeah. really. Yes. 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 And, yes. 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 and 
Mr. Scarron became Prime Minister in 2004. Right. So we're in 2021, uh, 17, 17 years ago. But you could still, still say, let's give 16 budgets. They have presented 16 budgets. Right. And out of the 16 budgets, in the same, same world, same thing, just a matter of shifting. Like I was saying, somebody today, like you clean your 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 your, your cabinet, your, your buffet. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a boy, we had cabinets. Right? Right, right, right. Your, your mother could do fancy. Yeah, yeah. Plates, so you, you should never use it. Yes. Until Christmas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dust them off. Yeah. Right. But they were there. So when you clean that up now, you shift something. So you can say, hey, let me put the. Because yeah, we don't want to put the job bottom. Right, yeah. right. But it's, it's statues up there. So okay. that's what he's doing. Every year, just one little thing. And, and then the words are nice words and so forth. Although sometimes when you listen to him, those who love him fine, they get convinced. Mm -hmm. But it's not about love. I think Dominica is the only country where you call, you say, the honeymoon period, that's what then. Right, right, right. To me, the honeymoon period is, is just for us, it's everlasting. And at the same time, our situation is getting worse. Right. right. Our young people are frustrated. You know, you know what the government did cleverly? They went in without all other countries doing research. You know, I'm thinking of doing some research on medical marijuana. Yeah. yeah. And all of them want to add a value to the marijuana. Right. So it brings some income. Right. So, so, so you can earn money from it. What they did, they decided to pass laws. So they be done up a certain amount. So people right. feel now, okay, well, even though I don't work, but I can smoke. Right, right. right. And I don't watch them. distracted. Because they, they, they give really? me something good. Yes. That's not how you run a country. And I, I listened to the company in St. Vincent. There was a guy who made a point on a platform. Right. And I told one of the people up there, this guy, he had one listed by seven votes, mm. no 20 votes. Mm. And I told him, this guy is going to lose that seat. Mm. He said, on his utterances there. Right. In the opposition, he's a member of the opposition. I told him, no, 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 his constituency is a marijuana mm -hmm. constituency. When the result came, he lost by one. And he did lose it by one. Right. And they say, and they told me a couple of weeks after, on their research mm -hmm. and investigation, that what I told them, what I told them this big comment was was the cause of the losing that seat. I see, I think Jeff, I I heard you want to try to come in there. Uh, uh, thank you. These things are laughable, you know, Mr. Boston and, and, and party leader Michael. When you tell me you are giving young people the opportunity to smoke marijuana on the street, you know what I would do if, it, if I was the young people? I would take that marijuana smoke and puff it off when the labor rights are passing and say, look at what you vote for, for me to be on the street smoking marijuana in your face. Instead of getting this group of young people who are in marijuana, look at, you have so much land, get lands organize to use this as an income to the country instead of this Clarence guy talking about if it's not passport was what to use this if you regulate this thing if you give those guys five thousand plants to go you grow it it is monitored it is inventory and anything extra that there will be a fine then you sell these oils and the remaining from the oil you can use it as a mosquito coil kind of bullet incense instead what do you do as mr boston said you're encouraging young people not to go to work smoke a joint and this is the best thing ever and when election come around again you're gonna do the same mistakes and after that you're gonna say to me boy give me five bucks things are tight young people of dominica listen to me carefully i went through the skills training program i work hard in this country and i can tell you this you listening right now my advice to you ask yourself this question am i better off today than 5 10 15 years what can I do for myself to help myself, to help my family, to help my country? Staying on the street, smoking pot is not going to help you. Mm -hmm. What you need from this government is to ask them to create opportunities for you to invest in yourself, to invest in them there, to create new jobs. You remember back in the Freedom Party with the Skills Training Program, through the JSP Program, you had people going through workshops and, and learn how to be carpentry, furniture people and all of that. And eventually started their own businesses and selling furniture to Aster Funds and Cots and all of these places. What happened to that? This is what you need so that you can start your own business, whether it's a plumbing trade you learn or something, then you can start your own trade thing and you can hire people. Smoking yes. marijuana on the street is not going to help you. It's going to defeat you. Because then when you go and get into spots, 
you're not going to be qualified because they're going to see you have enhancement job. Young people in Dominica, do the right thing. Every election, we have close to about 21% new voters. If these 21% of new voters decided they have enough of this government, they are going to make a change in this government and pick the right people like the Dominican Freedom Party. I can guarantee you, your life will be better off than it is today. Yes, jo um, Johnson, just, just, just to comment on Ian. I mean, Ian comes from a constituency. We have the time crunch there, Michael, so uh, Ian comes from a constituency where 30% of the GDP of the country was generated, Ross University, right? The hospital in its constituency is basically non-functional. In 1961, there was an operating theater that used to do operations. I mean, Lennox Honeychurch, our historian, was born of a caesarean section in 1951 in Portsmouth. That hospital, if you have to have a, a baby and you're a young person, they send you to Roseau. Just imagine, that is your constituency. And rather than focusing on improving your constituency from where it was, it is going down and you're going on the radio talking nonsense. We had boats every week loading produce to export north and south of Dominica. It doesn't, it, it, very, very little of that is going on. And you as a PAL rep not delivering and, and the people are still voting for you. Something is wrong. And his, his whole attitude in Portsmouth, not Portsmouth, in Parliament, sorry, was embarrassing for a young man coming from, from the Douglas family. I was very disappointed. Well, we have a caller there. It seems the first caller for the night. Let's take this caller. Hello, good evening. Over this line. Good evening. Yes. And I didn't listen to you, and especially Mr. Boston. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 And now I'm listening to him talking about Ruth and Gary. And I'm getting the same thing over and over. All over the world, you know, that it's a crisis on this budget. I think you should be at this present in the budget. What is the present in the budget? Tell me one thing that is there in the budget, please. Give us facts. You just spoke about the, um, about the chicken. So you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, you have your home, you, you, you work for how many years, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're in your mm -hmm. you know, take out. So, so the people that are working to take out what? What are you talking about? It's the task that is like the landlord will not be changed. The landlord. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so that's what I'm going to do. Well, I think I think I know what you're talking about. The landlord has removed the um, VAT, but they have removed VAT for income earned on rental properties. And um, yeah, I mean, but but it, this, these are these are good ideas. But but the point is, my friend, is these are very small things in the big scheme of things, yeah. right? These, these are very small things in the big scheme of what we need to do in this country. Don't give me that. Don't give me that at all. Don't give me that. You, hello, hello. Let me, my friend, my friend, my friend. We have a discussion. If you call us to have a fight, that is you. You will have your fight with yourself. If you call us, if you listen to me a while, please. If you have a discussion, we have a civilized discussion. Who you support doesn't matter. Who I support doesn't matter. We have a discussion. You raise a few points. We will agree with you. We will disagree with you, you will agree with us, and you will disagree with us on certain points. But the point is not a shouting and fighting that will give us anything. So go ahead, make, 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 make your point. Go ahead. What I'm saying, when you are about to 
I tell you that is not true. And you all have and you all have you, and you all have in your heart a greater sense of your heart of dislike and hate for other people than facing the facts. You talk about the rent thing, I was trying to understand what you were talking about. I know that they, they reduce on what do you call that? Uh, well, registration of property. Registration of property, but it also took that out for rental income. Right. If you, if you have rental income, you don't have to pay that on that. On that. But but but, but they have put a, a certain percentage of tax there. Yes, yes. There's other taxes. Other taxes there, there and so forth. So and, and why that might be, you know, there are certainly some things in the budget that are useful to individuals and useful things as we acknowledged before. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. But I think the point is. If, if we're going to spend 20 years prison, a, a little a little tax relief here, a little um, input there, a little fertilizer there, if we if, if that's the fundamental bar which which we hold this government accountable, we will not move forward oh, because these are small things. We need transformational things. We need transformational thinking, and that is what we argue here. Mm -hmm. Because to, to press those little things is not really going to make any of us anywhere forward. No, I, 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 you could still call on previous this government. Or this little thing. Of course, we have an issue, right? We should do that. We will, but we those will. who want to who want to encourage the government and criticize them when they are not performing on the big things, they could get angry with them and attempt to call them to want to give a maple and so forth. Keep your maple to yourself. And to your to your own circumstances. And you know what you say thing. I mean it's a nonsense. It's this he needs to explain what he means by that. We see ourselves as a distinct party from the United Workers Party. We certainly do not agree upon all policies. And we are a competing uh, political party in, in all aspects of it. So if, if he has a valid point that we are the same, then make the point and see see how we are. If you see where we need to differentiate, then make the point and tell us. We mm -hmm. want we are looking to do is to be effective political party. party of course. Well, there's a, there's a fundamental difference between the budget and what is done during the year of the budget because quite a few of the items that they have on the budget and the expenditure don't come to fruition. Okay? And these are some of the realities. In terms of the tax relief, on, on VAT relief and those things. These were things that were put on and they removed. Okay? But in terms of a budget creating employment from year to year, what I see from, from this administration and their budgets in delivering for the people, it is a massive failure. A lot of the productive things just imagine our tissue culture lab never produced one plant for the farmers mm -hmm. and it's in ruin and it costs yeah. taxpayers in europe millions of dollars absolutely michael so go ahead um, and the coffee plant too um yes uh but just to for the benefit of the general public do you know the fact was implemented by this government what? There was no VAT before. There was no VAT before. The VAT was right. implemented by this government. Right. So this government brought in VAT. Right. And if they see a need now to reduce VAT and right. certain things, what is the place about that? But they just implemented the VAT on the rental income like two years ago. Two years it was ago. Not, it was not there. And everyone's shouting and screaming that that's ridiculous. And they took it out. And they took it out. And now they want to be pressed for it. For it. it, 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 it. Just Mr. Boston, because Mr. Boston, yes, sir. Let me tell the caller something. This, I am not here to stand for nonsense. I'm down the middle, and as I said earlier, no matter who the political party can be part of, and you politically did something wrong, I'm gonna say, you see this nonsense of the Freedom Party songs that the UWP they need to stop that tactics, it's not working anymore, and that's why the Labour Party don't go after the Freedom Party. Because they do not want to upset the Freedom Party supporters there. You see, this nonsense needs to be stopped. The Dominican Freedom Party is an independent political party. And the Labour Party currently, I can speak of, have approached me many times to run, and I refuse, even Mr. Boston himself and others. 
So this nonsense about the freedom by the UWP need to be stopped. The UWP have their own agenda, have their own platform, and we have our own platform. As a matter of fact, if I was in parliament, the way I would respond to this government would be maybe totally different from the way the Labour, uh, UWP responds. But, but another thing, Kola, in 1994 of Freedom Party government, a teacher was making $1,400 without extra education from, apart from getting a GC um, or OA level, paying about $200 per month. A can of sardine was about 65 cents. A, a pound of sugar was about 70 cents. 2021, well, how many years later? What, 27 years? Um, um, how many years after that? Like 20 some years later? Sure. A salary for a teacher has not increased that significant. A can of sardine today is $5. How much is yes. a pound of sugar? Yes, well, a couple of are coming in. This is ridiculous. This well, government yes. has failed, and you have to understand they have failed. Some a couple of calls, a couple calls are coming in. Let's see the couple We have to leave it away. Right. Hello, good evening. Try to be very brief, huh, please. Yes. You heard anything? I my voice. Not yet. Hello, Colin. You still there? We have some technical difficulties here. No, so we just won't talk about it. Oh, yes, we hear you. You call us on? Yes, yes, I hear. Yeah. Yes, good night. Good night. I was, I was saying that I got to um, Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, all you're doing is, is correcting the problem that they created and they want to be crisper. Definitely. Um, it, it is respect all over the, all, all through the spectrum. It's the disability that we have lost in our society. Yes, so, it's not going through the... That's certainly something they have to address. All right. Um, um, we'll call this. Hmm? Hello, good evening. We call this here us. Hello. Yes, we hear yes, you. Go ahead. Not going through a tunnel. It's not going through. Can you hear us? Yeah, we have a bit of uh, technical difficulties um, with repairing our cars, but uh, we'll uh, we'll keep trying. Yes, I want to call Norris to see. Yeah. Well, while we uh, while we try to get this thing there, we pressed up against time here, and uh, we're about to get uh, wrapped up here. But uh, 
If we're going to squeeze a couple calls in, we'll, we'll try to make them, but um, no, I guess we will okay. So, um, I guess not get anything. You might get the voice. Nothing. Nothing at all. I mean, uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's, well let's, let's just try to, you know, move on. Well, the caller tried to call a while ago, but I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw that. Hello, good evening. Okay, go ahead, caller. We hear you. Yeah, go ahead. We, we, we hear you, but we have some difficulties, but we hear you. Um, I think at last count it was 46. I can validate that somewhere in that range here. But um, that 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 um, information came out uh, very uh, you know just tonight, as a matter of fact. So um, I, I think that's correct. Somewhere in that in the 40, low 40s is where we stand today. Yes. You know, uh, 45 active cases. Uh, um, I, 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 I will put it right now. Yes, uh, justice in justice in evening. Oh, I did it. You call it on? Call it. That call out. Yeah. You watch. But yes, call it. Just listening. Um, that 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 is the situation right now. So we have some difficulties, so technical difficulties. So we have to wind up and then yeah. get we're, we're out of time anyway, but it's a very interesting conversation and uh, we look forward to having more more, more of it. Now one thing callers um, our listeners, we, we plan to um, use this platform here to probably um, you know have a few more sessions during during the month. So um, we may not be in queue, but we certainly will be online. So look look out for that and announcements in that. As we continue the conversation, I mean, now is the season of the time again going on. Um, we need to be uh, in dialogue too, so uh, we'll keep we'll keep doing that. So uh, why don't we just get a few brief comments from the rest of the panelists as we we, we wrap up the program? So Jeff, you want to just say a few brief words and you'll have Mike to say something. No, I I just wanted. Um, I understood from some persons that. Jeff, can you hear me? That the, yes. the uh, every prime minister gets uh, past prime minister gets uh, a, a car every five years. To me, that is uh, something that was passed several years ago in the budget. And the car issued to Patrick John. Patrick John, since his death, I understood they came to take it. And and, and there are some people saying that they said they would return it. I do not know um, what. <laughs> I was very concerned about that. I do not know if we have any comments on that. Well, we, we, we're kind of out of time, Michael, for tonight. But if you have some brief comments, closing remarks, um, go ahead and make those. Well, I, I w would think that, that the head of state, if he dies before his spouse, I mean, that whatever benefits he has, like social security as a prime minister, should be passed on to the wife. But but for some reason something went off skew because I I knew in <laughs> our sister yeah, island. Mike, Michael, we don't have time to get into the issue now, and, and it's, it's a good point. We'll take it up next time. But do you have any closing comments on, yes, on just the program so we can start uh, moving to coaching? My closing comment. My closing comments. You know, it's it's. I have great concerns with the, the 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 government managing the economy, in particular the crisis, the COVID crisis, and their budget does not um, address the economic crisis that we have in turning it around, the unemployment of our youth, and the government's focus on on um, giving foreign truckers or um, business persons advantages of our local contractors and, and employees yes, is of uh, great concern. And yes. I'm hoping that, I was hoping the budget will address that and it failed miserably in that regard. Right. Jeff? Yes, Jeff. Uh, 
Well, thank you guys, and thank you to all the listeners who listen. I got quite a bit of messages um, from people in the US and some within the Caribbean and Dominica who listen and said, great program. Um, um, I just want to make this appeal out there that we need to come together despite our political party that we may support or opinion. We should not call each other names that unnecessary. Um, instead of creating hatred, we should create love. And let's look at the real issues. Um, you know, the Labour Party, UWP, myself, we may not see certain things eye to eye, but let's at least agree on what is best for Dominica moving forward. And, and let's invest in our young people. I believe our young people are the future of this country. We need to look at some significant improvement with the way that we deal with our young people and do that investment with oh, our young yeah. people. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, you too. Yes. Um, I, I think we've said it, um, the, the most critical thing, and we keep pounding this message because we believe this message is true, the, the Labour Party government is, 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 is just simply does not show the sort of innovative mindset that is necessary to transform a developing country into a developed country. We bring that to the table. That is what we are about. We are we're innovative, uh, capable people. Uh, we, we, we are focused on doing the right things for the society, not ourselves. And that is what you need in order to transform a developing country. You need people who have that ability, that mindset, that capability. This budget does not show that. It shows clearly that the Dominican Labour Party lacks uh, imagination, but even worse, it lacks a fundamental understanding of how wealth is created and a fundamental belief in the capability of uh, the Dominican people that we have the skills, that we have the intelligence, and that we have the, 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 the capacity and the desire to transform our country. In, and then together as a group, as a team. And those fundamental misunderstandings create a lot of dysfunctional behavior and a lot of, 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 of unfulfilled promises on a while. Well, folks, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I think we had a very good discussion. For those of you listening at home and abroad, we want to say thank you for being with us. And we always appreciate your listenership and, of course, your calls and your comments and your advice and your questions and so forth. We take it in the stride and as I said, our aim is to educate and inform and I've been in politics since I was a 13 year old boy and I am no longer 13 year old and I'm still, mm -hmm. yeah. still looking. Still right. looking. <laughs> and I'm saying no one will derail my contribution to Dominica and Absolutely. when one call and asks or make his comment or her comment, I take it in good stride, so I don't take it in any anger but I will not be derailed or not be um, put down by anyone who feel their political mission is put down. I mean, just to say, um, there are people today who are ministers in the Labour Party, and they, they were UWP, and some people hold them up high. Yes, yes, of course. So if I go look at two to company seeker, what is wrong with that? That's a, they are Dominicans, and parties all over the world at some point collaborate. In the United States, when they are at war, the Republicans and Democrats meet with the president right, of course. to discuss their strategy as to how they um, go into it Just and how they right. come out of it and so forth. And similarly, in Dominica, I, mean, I have seen where government, when there's a crisis, the prime minister call the opposition and they discuss and see how they can get the matter solved. I'm only just to say, let's pray. But I waited on sale tape. So um, when you call and you see what you see, it doesn't bother me. Don't listen very well tonight. So thank you very much. Right. God bless you and God bless our listeners at home and abroad. Have a good night rest and all the best. Good night, everyone. Good night. Until next time. Next time.